So uh, about two or three weeks ago, um, we as City on a Hill represented um, our little church in a huge gathering down in the most horrible and evil place in the world, Orlando, Florida. We were suffering for Christ um, very much, and uh, it, was, it was myself and, and my wife Taylor, and uh, Larry and Kayla joined us, um, and then we had some other friends, Corey Johnson, his wife Andrea, uh, came along and hung out with us, um, and, and the global gathering for Acts 29 is really super interesting, um, because you, you end up in this huge hotel in the middle of Orlando, Florida, which is, is kind of like Disney World, except you're not in Disney World, but you pay the Disney World prices for everything. And so our little Midwest selves got down there and were like, it's $12 for a bottle of water? I'm confused. And so, so we all show up to Orlando, Florida, and of course, being from Missouri, we get off the plane, and immediately we're okay with the weather, like it's a little cool here, like your humidity's not nearly as hot. And uh, we, we get ushered into the hotel, and we go up, and we, we see our rooms, and, and immediately the first thing that I saw there was um, a lot of the people in the hotel didn't look like me. And, and, and I've traveled a good fair being in the military and, and some other things. And so um, it's, I'm not unaccustomed to hearing other languages. But when we got into the global gathering, you could hear lots of languages. And it was really, really unique. It was, it, was, it was almost comforting in a sense that, that there were all of these people here. And um, so we get into the global gathering and uh, there's lots of really great teaching, and there's lots of really high-profile pastors there, and, 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 and all of these people. But what struck me as, as we started this introductory um, kind of sermon was that there were 52 countries gathered in Orlando, Florida, at this Acts 29 gathering. 52 countries. Thank you. Glory to God. Glory to God. And so the experience went something like this. We would show up to, to go to the sessions or the, the sermons that they were preaching, and, and we would be, our, our, our senses, our, our, our selves were assaulted with culture. Like we would, we would sing in Spanish and sing in African languages and, and sing in things we didn't even know what we were singing, but we knew we were bringing glory to Christ. And then when we were hearing sermons, they were coming in Portugal, which kind of like sounds like Spanish, but it's not. And it felt kind of uncomfortable. Like I'm listening to the sermon with a, a gentleman who's speaking in Portuguese and and and. You're like, I don't like having to have to have it translated to me. And then when we were singing the songs, it was, it was different because there were people of all sorts of cultures and ethnicities that were dancing around and, and they didn't look like the frozen chosen of Missouri. <laughs> like there was lots of amens and hallelujahs and they were excited. And it was different. And you could see in the room that it was pressing on everybody as you brought this group of people together to worship a Christ Jesus. And, and for the past couple of weeks, I've been thinking about this and praying kind of through this. And um, when, I, when Taylor and I had left and we went to go help out the church at Bevo, we, we saw a lot of this. That was a very multi, multicultural church. We had Iranians, and we had lots of South American friends and family, and we had, you know, we worshipped um, regularly in Spanish because um, our, our worship leader was from uh, Puerto Rico, and so he was much more comfortable in Spanish than he was in English. And so it, it was kind of like this almost comfortable feeling to me. But what, what really got me thinking was, when I, when I worship Jesus, when I think about Jesus and the, the body of Christ, do I think about my family that's worshiping in Jesus in Japanese or in Chinese or in Portuguese? 
Like when, when I think of the body of Christ, is that what I'm thinking of? That there's this huge global body of people worshiping in every time zone and culture? Or do I think that the body of Christ is, is my local church? And then we'll sprinkle in a few other churches because, you know, I know they're pastors, so we like them. And it kind of sat heavy on my heart. So I did some research, and, and I want to read this to you. This comes from um, some website that I'm sure has absolute uh, complete authority on these numbers, so take it as a gospel. But I think it's, 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 it's close to being accurate. So the Joshua Project says this. It is, an es- it is estimated that 7.47 billion people are alive in the world today. 7.47 billion people. It's a lot of zeros. And 3.15 billion of them lived in what they call unreached people groups with little or no access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is according to the Joshua Project. To, to make it a little more granular, there are approximately 16,800 unique people groups in the world. And about 6,900 of them are considered unreached, that they have no access to the gospel, period. The vast majority of these, that's 95% of these people, exist on what they call the 1040 corridor. So basically, if you took the equator and you went 10 degrees south and 40 degrees north, that's the 1040 corridor. corridor. And less than 10% of our global missionary work is, is done by these people. So to put it more succinctly, Almost half of the world does not have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And less than 10% of our missionaries that we send out into those areas are engaging those people groups. So I got to thinking. That's a whole lot of people that are not hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's a whole lot of my time that I am not considering that in the most impoverished countries in the world where people dying at an incredible click are not hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that saves souls, the gospel that brings dead men to life, the gospel that decrees eternity, The gospel of joy and love and peace and happiness and love. That's almost half the world's population. This is astonishing. This is something that we, we, we should sit back in in our, our prayer lives that, that we should look and we should go, if we believe that the gospel is the salvation of humankind, that, that we need to preach the gospel and half of the world is not hearing the gospel, it should be, a, it should be conflicting in our souls. It should be tearing us up that we don't have people engaged there. As much as it tears us up when we hear about our friends that don't believe the gospel or our family members that don't believe the gospel, which puts us at the big idea today. The big idea is this, Christ died for you individually so that you could die for a global call. Christ died for you individually so that you could die for a global call. Now, now let me break this down before we get into our passage, which, if you have your Bibles open, will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll start in verse 12. So there's an axiom, a saying in Christianity, that if you were the only person in the world, Christ still would have come and, and died for you. And on, on principle, I believe this is correct. 
And I believe this is correct because we hear in Jeremiah that God knitted you in your mother's womb. We know that he knows every hair on your head. He's known your name from the beginning of time. That he has a new name for you, Christian, when when he brings complete and full redemption into the world. We know that he loves you on an individual level. And for us sitting today, that that should be something that comforts our hearts. That the God of the universe, the creator of all, the Alpha and the Omega, knows your name and he cares about you uniquely as an individual. But when, when Christ Jesus came onto this earth to live the life that you couldn't live and subsequently died the death that you deserved and was resurrected into life, bringing you new life, he didn't do that. So that you could live on this earth in the midst of all of the things going around and ignore the rest of the world. In fact, he did it with an absolute express mission for each and every one of us. So in Acts chapter 1, 6 through 8... Jesus is resurrected, and he's about to ascend into heaven, and his disciples are having the same question that you're having now. If Christ died, then, then for what? What is it that we're supposed to do now with this, with this great information? And so they asked him, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They wanted to know, like, you're king and you've resurrected and we see that that you really are God. Are are you going to just take away all of our problems and and get rid of the the Romans? Or are you going to restore Israel to its great promise? Are you going to bring your kingdom up and and, and we're just going to reign forever and ever? And Jesus says, this to them. He says, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you'll receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and catch this, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he said, I'm going to give you the power of the Holy Spirit. God is going to indwell in you. I have a purpose for you. I've inaugurated the kingdom, and I'm passing that movement of the kingdom to you so that you can proclaim my excellencies to Judea, to Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. So I want to take a second and just take a step back and think about that because in our context through our Western lens, we often think this, and it, it's true when we, when we take it and individualize it and put it into our context. What, what Christ is saying is that we, we need to be missionaries to our homes, to our families, to Jefferson County, and then we get a little bit further out, Samaria, maybe, maybe uh, uh, St. Louis, maybe Missouri, and then we continue to go on to the ends of the world. But as he's saying this to the disciples, what he's, not, what he's saying is, is you need to start here in Jerusalem and expand this out to the rest of the world. We are the rest of the world that he was talking about. We are. So from, the, from a thousand years ago, there have been men and women with the gumption and the moxie to proclaim the gospel in all of the areas so that I can preach the gospel today in this church, in Arnold, in Jefferson County. It didn't just happen because there was a group of people that huddled themselves together in Jerusalem and said, we're going to keep this glorious gospel to ourselves. They said, no. We're going to proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus, the risen Savior, to the ends of the world. And it's why we're here now. And if you have any idea of the history of the world, you have a, you'll recognize that they were proclaiming the gospel through a whole lot of really horrific times. I mean, Napoleon's in there. Dude was not a nice dude. We have the Byzantine Empire, we have the Black Plague, we have the Enlightenment in which everybody tried to shelve the gospel into its own little world. 
We have world wars that were, were, were gone through there. I mean, the history of the, of the world sits in this, this time span, and yet there were men and women who believed that the gospel of Jesus Christ was the paramount and the only thing that saves the soul. And so they pressed, and they prayed, and they moved in unison as one body. But I get it. We're in a different age. We've got a, a, a big city, and, and, and we have lots of commerce that kind of goes through our areas, and, and it's a different time. We've got Facebook, and Twitter, and Instagram, and whatever else that we have. I was going to say Tinder, but that's probably not appropriate in this context. <laughs> it's different, right? And we have this assault on, on Christianity where, where everybody can say everything that they want about Christians and, and, and we've gone through book burnings and maybe we'll go back and do that again. Like, there's a lot of things that are going on in the world. But Paul is writing to a, a Corinthian church which was also a large commerce. It had lots of things going on. They had lots of, of, of crazy, um, inappropriate sin that was going on in the church. And so Paul's letter to the Corinthians is really addressing that they have, they've gone on and they've, they've assumed a lot of what the world says into their church. And he's correcting that in this, in this letter. And so in chapter 12, just to, to give you a, a little premise, Paul is talking about the spiritual gifts, and the, the Corinthian church has gone wild with their spiritual gifts, and they're using them inappropriately. And, and Paul has essentially said, look, I want you to continue to seek after the spiritual gifts. And then he gets into the section in verse 12, and he's talking about the body. And that's where I want to land today as we look at the Scripture. Paul says this, Verse 12, he says, Just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. So in a very wordy section, he's essentially saying, look, we all have a body. We have lots of, of phalanges and hair follicles and noses and mouths. We all have these parts in our body, and there's, there's many of these parts of the body. And he says, just like the church as one body has many members of the body, Many members of the body. And he's uniquely addressing the fact that each and every one of us have unique and spe special spiritual gifts which make up the totality of the body of Christ. There are some that preach. There are some that teach. There are some that are incredibly generous. There are some that, that are incredibly empathetic. There are some people that make us laugh, and there are some people that we'd rather not be around. But the reality is, is we are all one body. We are one body in Christ. So I got to thinking, what does it mean to be in Christ? It's a term that we throw around Christianity all of the time. We're in Christ. What does that mean? Huh. Put you on the spot. So I was thinking about this idea of being in Christ and and the world and, and the world has kind of um, developed a oneness about it in some areas of it that I think um, are, are a good representation and yet uh, a terrible form of being in something. So we have the St. Louis Cardinals, right? We're all Cardinals fans. That should be like a joy box woo. And we, we all love the Cardinals, right? Good, bad, indifferent. Even if we think that uh, Schilte's not doing what he's supposed to do, we, we love the Cardinals regardless of what they're doing. Amen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. How many of us are actually on the Cardinals team? Not so many of us. In fact, if we really wanted to be honest, there's a oneness about St. Louis Cardinal baseball that, that Missouri just kind of drives and hones, but at the end of the day, we're not on that team, and, and our um, love for Cardinal baseball, as much as we want to keep it there, is pretty fleeting. 
Like if, if the Cardinals are doing well and you watch any of the social media and or the newspapers, you would think the world had come to an end. They're ready to kick players out if, if they go 0 for 3 in a game. Like it's pretty amazing. So, so oneness may be not as appropriate with the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, the, the army has the army of one. It's something that they've developed and it's been incredibly well researched and, and, and they have systematically programmed every soldier and airman and sailor and marine to, to, to buy into this oneness of a mission. And that mission is, is different missions all over the world, but, but there's a oneness about them. What happens when you leave the military though? that oneness starts to, to kind of fade. And I know, I know, uh, once a Marine, always a Marine. I get that. Um, some of the special operations teams will always be special operations teams. Those operators really know each other well. Um, but in general, people get out of the military, and that oneness of mission kind of goes away. But in the body of Christ, it's, it's different. And it's, it's different because you didn't choose to, to join the team. You didn't choose to get into the game. You didn't choose which side you were going to be on. You were dead, and then Christ Jesus made you alive through his death and his resurrection. And he said, I want you... You were filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit brought under the umbrella of his family, and then given a mission because now you have new life to go proclaim the excellencies of Christ Jesus so that others may have life. I mean, it's fairly simple. If you have the most glorious news in the whole world, and someone says, go share it, it should be something that's fairly easy to do. We want to go share it. That's being in Christ Jesus. To put it differently, Jesus' blood covers all of us and therefore we have been given righteousness so that we have the honor of proclaiming Christ to the world. That is one body. But I get it. It's hard. Because it's, it's, it's uncomfortable. Like as we sit in this room, I know that some of us are going, man, it's uncomfortable to just outwardly speak the name of Jesus and, and, and to discuss his glories because we, we know that our friends maybe or maybe don't want to hear about it. We don't want to be ostracized and feel as like we're that weird Christian that always talks about Jesus. In some places of the world, because we're talking about a, a global uh, space here, it might mean subsequent death. That might mean that a jihadist pulls his Kalishnikov out and pops a couple of rounds into our head. That we're beheaded. That we're tortured. Put on display on a YouTube video. But it's difficult. It's difficult to proclaim the glories of Christ. And, and so Paul addresses it in verse 13. He says, For in one spirit, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. I think the biggest problem that the church has today is we've forgotten to drink from the spirit. That Christ empowered us, that the Spirit dwells in us, yet we don't want to look to the Spirit for empowerment of the preaching of the gospel. That we don't want to ask the Spirit for the words in which can be conveyed the gospel to, to hearts that are being changed. We want to live in, in the culture in which we are gods and we're going to go out and we're going to do our mission. That we can't step back for even just 10 minutes and ask the Spirit, where do you want me to go? And it's why we're frustrated. It's why we're hurt. It's why we have a hard time reconciling relationships. It's why a good majority of Christianity has fallen into a, a Sunday worship session and a do whatever you want from Saturday to Monday. 
It's because we don't engage in the Spirit. We don't drink of the Spirit. It's also interestingly enough why when I read that 7.14 billion people aren't hearing the name of Christ Jesus, that we recoil a little bit. As if we listen to the Spirit, maybe he would call us to, to move on that number. Maybe he would call us up like Jeff Neville and say, I want you to take all nine of your children and move to India for a year while you can train up the pastors there. Maybe he would call us out of our comfort zones and we would preach to the gospel that, that God would use to, to go proclaim it into northern Africa. It's uncomfortable. But it's uncomfortable because we're fighting the spirit inside of us saying, saying we want to do our thing. Don't, don't challenge my worldview. Don't challenge my schedule. Don't challenge my calendar. Don't challenge my five-year plan. Because I don't want to hear what your plan is. And so we don't drink from the Spirit. We're clouded by the things of this world. We're clouded by our days. The busyness, the things we have to get done that provide zero, zero benefit to the proclamation of the gospel in unreached people groups to 3.4 billion people and to our neighbors as we're called to Jerusalem, to Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. But I get it. There's a lot of us who are going, I'm not really a missionary. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not really geared that way. It's not my, my calling. Maybe, maybe you're, you're a little bit introverted. Maybe that's not where you want to be. So Paul addresses that in verse 14. He says, the body does not consist of one member, but many. We have many members with many talents, many gifts. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would make it any less part of a body. And if the ear should say, because, or the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were to be an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But it is God who arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. So let's break that down. Paul is making this beautiful imagery of the body. And if, if the ear were to say to the foot, like, I can't be part of the body, it's going to be a little awkward. We can't hear. If, the hand, if everybody were hands, not going to work. If we're all one eye, then it's going to be like the Lord of the Rings and that creepy eye that sits up on the tower. I've never seen the movie, so I'm taking a guess here. I only read the books. Like, it's going, to be, it's going to be a little bit interesting. It's not going to be a full, complete, unified body. And so Paul is addressing the spiritual gifts that each and every one of us have on us, that have us. Some of us are evangelists. Some of us are teachers. Some of us are preachers. Some of us have amazing amount of generosity. Some of us care for people. We all have unique individual gifts that God is using in arranging us around. That's, that's his, his main call in this section. But on further thought, there's a, a second calling. There's a second premise to this. And, and I'm going to make the argument coming off of that last passage that we reread. He said, we were all baptized in one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. And we were all made to, to drink of one spirit. So I think the secondary point to this is that we have a lot of Christians, a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ, who don't look like us. They were the Jews or the Greeks, the slaves or the free. That's pretty encompassing of all of the people around. Who are worshiping right now or worshiping in a different time zone right now when the clock catches up to them. That are worshiping in, in different ways and, 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 and worshiping the, the same Jesus. They're, they're proclaiming the gospel in, in song and dance. They're doing all sorts of really unique and cool expressions of worship. And so I want to challenge the body here right now. 
that when we start to engage and encounter other forms of worship, oftentimes in our context, it's, it's used as like the black church and the white church, which I, I really dislike that, uh, but we use it because it's terminology that we use. When, when we see that, we have to understand the expression of the gospel. As long as the gospel is a core central element, the expression of the gospel is very open-handed and very accepting and very beautiful. Because what the church needs less of is denominational roll calls in which we build up walls and we, we try to stop things from happening and we want to be tight in our own little network of groups. And we want to keep out anybody who, who makes us feel uncomfortable with our worship because it's uncomfortable. And the body, the one body, the, the, the body of Christ from Ecuador to Nicaragua to the United States to Canada, even Canada, all the way to Israel is in, is in one body worshiping one Jesus with one true gospel. Because this, this idea of denominational bantering and, and not reaching across the lines, and, and it's garbage. Hands down garbage. If Satan has done one thing brilliantly over the past hundred years, he's told men that their ideas of denominational is better than the next guy and keep that neighbor off our lawn. The church has to be more aggressive in grabbing together and pooling our resources so that 3.4 billion unreached people can be met. We have enough resources in the body to do it. And so Tim and I and Mike, the elder team, have, have made it a press in our local Jerusalem here to reach across the lines and pull pastors from any, anybody. We offered, it, we offered the invitation to probably 50 pastors to come and pray with us. Come and worship. Come and read Scripture. Let us pool our resources. It's why we're having conquering addictions at Oak Bridge. Because we've pooled those resources together and said, you guys have a beautiful facility and like, 5,000 members, you can put something off. We'll help train, we'll resource, we'll bring it in. Jefferson County needs conquering addictions. And so we said, we're not going to a huddle tight. We're going to bring in churches and we want to make this thing happen. But what we need is a global calling, a calling, a death to ourselves so that we can fill that global calling, so that we continue to press that out, not just in Jefferson County, but in St. Louis, in Missouri, in the United States. Because we are all one body. Greek, Jew, slave, free, it's encompassing. If you are a Christian, you are part of this body, and it is part of your problem. So wherever you fit, in a political level, what I, want you to what I want to tell you today is that this idea of nationalism that we have been presented is not a Christian nationalism. Let me rephrase it to you this way. If you've ever thought, it's not my problem what's happening over in northern Africa, you're wrong. It is your problem because Christ said it's my problem and you are in him and he is in you. The genocidal atrocities that continue to go on throughout the world are your problem. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is not being proclaimed out into the world. And so you can argue economically, you can argue socially, uh, social geo or, uh, geopolitically about nationalism within the country. We can have those conversations. But when it comes to those souls of the human beings that are dying, it's your problem. Because Christ Jesus made it your problem when he brought you from death to life. And if all of this is a little heavy, I get it. Sometimes I get a little amped up and I yell. And I apologize, but not really. That last section, 
where Paul says, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. It should be the most lifting and freeing aspect of that whole dialogue. Because it's not up to you to decide where you're going to go and what you're going to do and where you're going to pull your resources and am I going to be a missionary out into the world or am I going to stay here and be a missionary in my home and just proclaim Jesus to the, to the people of Walmart? What Paul is saying there is that God is arranging his people so that his glory may be most glorified. And that if we can sit and listen to, to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he will tell us where he wants to go and what he wants us to do. He's not saying, you people need to pull up your bootstraps, gear up, and you need to go do this. What he's saying is, is I'm going to move my people in the giftings that I have given them so that they can continue to provide the gospel, to bring the gospel, the glory of Christ Jesus, into each and every part. All you have to do, church, shut up and listen. Just listen. Because God has promised over and over and over again that he will tell you and he will guide you and he will be with you. In fact, Matthew 18, or Matthew 28, when, when Jesus gives us this commission, he says, and behold, I will be with you forever and always. Behold, I will be with you forever and always. So the king of kings is promising that he will be with you forever and always, regardless of where you go. And so if he calls you into Somalia, in which you start proclaiming the gospel, you will be killed by a Somalian raider. He said, I'll be with you. Be like Daniel in the lion's den. Go. You're not going to get burned up by the fire. You have eternal life. Glory to God. As the great hip-hop artist Thizzle says, you could take my life. It's yours. You bought it on the cross. Take it. Use me. Proclaim the glories of the gospel. Do it. Go, church. Be the church. I'm with you. but we have to stop being such timid Christians. So worried about how are we going to get the next task on our list done? Oh no. Are our kids going to wake up at the appropriate time for their nap time? And I get it. It's, it's serious. We got a three-year-old. I want him to wake up and go to bed when he needs to. Like I get that. But we worry about such inconsequential things in our lives and it causes so much anxiety. As if Christ Jesus didn't promise to be with you and he empowered you with the Holy Spirit. God himself is indwelling with you. What are you worried about? The three, four point one, four billion of people that are not hearing the gospel. That's what we should be worried about. The broken that are right outside our doors, the homeless, the heroin epidemic all over our streets. That's what we should be worried about. The proclamation of the gospel. But Paul leaves us with a, with a warning. Paul leaves us with a warning and an encouragement, I think, to each and every one of us. In verse 21, he says, he continues on, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need for you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem weaker are indisposable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor and the unpresented parts are treated with greater modesty which are more presentable parts that do not require. But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have some care for one another. 
If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. And so what Paul says in this warning is, and this is, this is, is an incredible warning to the church as a whole, is that just as Jesus presented that the last shall be first and the first shall be last and come to me as little children, that we as the church cannot and have to fight against the idea that the, the mega church pastor or the one who is preaching or leading worship or has the most YouTube hits or is the most prominent member of our church, that they are the most important people in all of the church. Because Paul's warning here is that we can get so sucked up into that cultural equivalency that we start to, to, start to think that they're the ones that are out doing the ministry. It's the preachers and the teachers that do the ministry of Christ Jesus. When in fact it's Christian that does the ministry of Christ Jesus. It's those little bits of minutia in your life in which Christ Jesus shines so brightly. It's those conversations, those engagements with the folks when you go out to eat that you make sure that you tip them well. It's the small conversations that lead to a, a bigger gospel conversation that matter. In fact, those are most honored. It's you presenting this, this gospel from a proclamation of your own story that he's talking about. He says, church, don't get puffed up. He says, don't get puffed up with, with, with a guy on stage. It's you and you and you and you and you that make up this glorious body which is going to bring the redemption of the world through the power of the Spirit in Christ Jesus. You have been called as a kingdom of priests so that the inaugurated kingdom can go forth. You are the ones that bring forth this beautiful idea of the kingdom in which people can see just a, a fraction, a sliver of what life with God will look like when He redeems the world forever and ever and there will be no more crying and no more pain and no, many, no more tears anymore. You are the city on the hill. You are the light that cannot be hidden in a basket. It's you. And it's me. And so in context, when we look at each other and, and maybe some of us don't have the gifting of preaching or the, the gifting of leading in worship or the, the, the giftings that, that are, are more stage-worthy, if you will, he's saying each and every one of you has giftings which are required for the body to function, that we can move out as a family, that we can take on this impossible mission empowered by the Spirit with, with the, the glories of God being, the glories of God's hands being wrapped around His whole church in the world that, that He's unifying us and bringing us together. And, and He wants to get into that 1040 corridor. He just needs men and women to, to preach the gospel, to be willing to say yes. And so it was encouraging for my heart, and I hope it's encouraging for your heart, that, that there were 52 countries represented at the global gathering, all with different trials and tribulations, all with different contexts and, and musical liturgies and skin colors and language, but preaching the gospel nonetheless. And so I'm going to end with this because I think it's something that we have to, to take into account and I don't want to skip over it. Paul makes this argument that the church is, is the body and we're all members of it. And I want you to think about the last time that you were cooking. And in my house, when you're cooking, if, if you don't bleed or you don't burn yourself on something, like you haven't been cooking aggressively enough. Yeah. And so I want you to think back about that time where, you know, you, you, you took your finger and, and maybe you cut it with a knife because you were 
trying to get those ribs just perfect or you know you burnt yourself on the on 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 something and it hurt right it hurt and it didn't just hurt in that one localized area like like it, it makes you feel bad like the whole thing starts to hurt your your neurons start firing and you can fill it up your arm and and all of those things paul paul says this is just like the churches or it should be with the body of Christ. He says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member suffers, all suffer together. And so while we've, we've got everybody in tables, I want you to, to start thinking about some of the places that you know where people are suffering. Hong Kong would be a great one. Syria, the Middle East, China, we, pretty much anything from the corridor slightly up. And I want you to think about praying for those brothers and sisters who are suffering there. And maybe during that time we can pray for the brothers and sisters that are suffering just outside our door and in St. Louis and in the United States. Because if this is true, and it is true, because it was written by the Spirit through Paul's hands, then it should hurt us a little bit when we think about our brothers and sisters in, in Hong Kong, for example, protesting for the right of religious freedom. It should hurt us to know that in most northern African countries, you're not allowed to proclaim the name of Christ that in Saudi Arabia, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ can end you, end you up beheaded. And so while those martyrs and those men that are, are faithfully serving Christ Jesus suffer, our call is that we suffer with them at the very least in prayer at the very least, in prayer. But then Paul doesn't leave us right there. He says this. He says, and if one member rejoices, then all rejoice. Much like when you get a great massage and your whole body feels so amazing. I don't know, I hate massages, but I've heard that that's like the great thing that as things happen, that we rejoice amazingly well together, that we as Christians stop, stop namby-pambying around with our rejoice and celebration, that we celebrate loudly, that we throw the best parties, that we're the most joyful people on the planet, so joyful that, that you guys can cover over the fact that Larry and I are absolutely curmudgeons, like, amazingly joyful. The people want to come in and join us in celebration. That we throw the biggest parties, that, that we proclaim His excellencies through the amazing work that Christ Jesus has given us. The freedom to eat the food that we want, to drink the drinks that we want, to engage the world and, and enjoy all that God has given us. Enjoy it. Because while this sermon centered around 3.4 billion people who have not heard the glories of Jesus Christ, if one of them hears the glories of Jesus Christ, we should absolutely celebrate. It should be a huge deal, a proclamation that, that one has been lost and now is found. There's parables about it. Who does that? The church should do that. And so we have a group that prays diligently and suffers with the people who are suffering, and we have a group that celebrates with those who are celebrating. We have a family together, a body that works together in complete homeostasis so that as we move forward, Christ is proclaimed into the world to stop the denominational garbage, to go out and to reach across the land, for brothers and sisters, to stop fighting our little infights about open-handed doctrinal issues, to come forth and bring the glories of Christ Jesus to the world. And why do we do that? 
Why? Because we were once dead, and now we're alive. And we're forgetful. We're forgetful of this amazing reality that we were once dead, and now we're alive. And so Jesus gave us an opportunity three times a day in remembrance of that. On the night before he was betrayed, Jesus took this bread and he said, every time that you break this bread, I want you to remember the, the body that was broken on the cross for you. I took your sins so that you could be free and were free indeed. And he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples. And, and likewise, he took the cup of wine and he said, this is, this is the blood, the blood of the new covenant. The blood that was shed for you and covers you and encompasses you and has given you your righteousness in front of God the Father. And he said, every time you drink of this, remember me. And so on, sitting on a hill, we... We practice open communion. And so at each one of your tables, there's, there's the bread and the juice. And so if you're a Christian in the room, I, I, I urge you, I encourage you to partake in, in communion as one body, as one family. And then just spend a few minutes in time and, in prayer for our, for our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria, and into the ends of the world. Because it was the Christians thousands of years ago who were doing the same thing so that we could proclaim the gospel in this room today. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom that you've given us. We thank you for your son who lived the life that we couldn't. He died the death that we deserved and he was resurrected in new life, giving us new life. And he ascended into heaven so that we could see his glory as we know that we will be glorified on the day that he comes back. And just as John prayed in the book of Revelation, Jesus, come back. Jesus, come back. We're calling out to you. We're calling out to you. Spirit, move in our hearts so that we can be a change agent in the world. That the body would come together to proclaim your excellencies because you are worth it. And we recognize that we are alive because of you. And we thank you. Amen.